You are listening to the world's number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. Now, we are in the month of December. Uh, a lot of people start to think about fitness this month. We have the holidays. We tend to overeat. Not a lot of activity going on. Uh, right around the time January kicks in, people really start to flood the gyms or start working out. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to address all of you who are just getting started. Maybe you used to work out in the past, but you haven't done it for a long time. Or maybe you've never really worked out in a structured, consistent way. This episode is for you. We cover all of it from beginning to end. Now, as you're listening to the episode, you're getting good information. If you want something really specific, something that really spells it out for you, if you're listening and you're thinking, look, I just want to be able to open up a workout and follow along and do exactly what it says because I'm having challenges putting this together. I don't want. I want to take out all the guesswork. We have a a, a beginner weightlifting bundle, which is a bunch of programs designed to be used specifically by beginners. Okay, this bundle includes three programs. Uh, it includes uh, uh, access to a private forum, so you have support with other fitness-minded people. It's discounted heavily. Learn a little bit about it. Go to our site, mapsdecember.com. Check it out for yourself. Uh, see what it's all about. Listen to the episode. If at the end of the episode you decide this is something you want to sign up for, it's very easy to sign up. You get lifetime access. Then all you have to do is go to your computer, click on the button. Uh, there's your workout for the day. All the programs done together will give you about nine months all planned out. Again, that's at mapsdecember.com. By the way, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Chili. Now they make devices that go over your bed. These are actually pads, water-cooled pads that go over your mattress, under your sheets, that cool or warm your bed. You program them to warm them or cool them to your desired temperature. Um, some of these even come with two sides. So your spouse can have a totally different temperature than you. Again, it's water-cooled, so there's no EMFs. There's no wires in the pad. Um, and it can really cool your bed down a lot. I think it gets it down to in the 50s, for example, or you can warm it way up if you like a warm, toasty bed. Now, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get 22% off their products. Go check them out. Go to chilitechnology.com. That's C-H-I-L-I technology.com forward slash Mind Pump. Then use the code PUMP22. That's P-U-M-P-2-2 for 22% off. Hey, I got I got something. Uh for us to do today. I think that would be kind of fun, right? Challenge our, our trainer brains here. Since we're coming up on the new year. Oh, this is a big time in fitness. Yeah, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, we're, we're around the corner is uh, New Year's resolution, which uh, every year, you know, weight loss and fitness is in the top three at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's always a, a just you know herd of people that come into the gym. Massive influx. Right? Yep. Yeah. And so- The momentum wave. What I'd like to challenge us with is- Let's let's build the ideal programming, okay, for a person coming in, a beginner that is coming in to get personal training from when he goes. Now, I what I know is we're gonna have to challenge ourselves a bit here because there's a lot of things we know that are individualized. But let's try and think of the most common avatar. I that, think that's fair. Know? I think that's fair because I I would say a good seventy to eighty percent of the beginners that you would see or people who just are just getting started as part of their New Year's resolution, there's a lot of similarities yeah. among them. Right. I can think of posture stuff and chronic pain things. Exactly. And goals. Are very, very similar. Exactly. And, and it's important. It's so important when you're a beginner. It's so important to start on uh, the right foot, to start off the right way, because uh, that can really set the tone. If you start off the wrong way, you can uh, you run a high risk of a couple different things, uh, either injury too much pain, or you get results initially, and then you plateau so hard mm -hmm. that you're you just lose all inspiration to work out because uh, oh, it's two months later, my body stopped responding. I forget what where the I can't remember the stat what the number was, but it was a it was a pretty high percentage of people that get started on their fitness journey in January that end up injuring themselves within the first eight weeks. It's very wow. high. Yeah. I know most stop. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I managed gyms for, for decades, and every January we would see a 60 to 100% increase in in traffic, in, in, in new people coming in, mm -hmm. interested in joining. And by March or April, 
uh, they were pretty much gone. It was back to normal. So you see this huge wave. January, February was big too. By March, it took a big dip. And then by April, it was and, like we're And done. really, I think there's two things that attribute to that the most, which one, the injury thing, getting hurt, because that's really discouraging, obviously, yeah. when you first start off. And then the other is the the hard plateaus, which you alluded to. Mm-hmm. because And that has a lot to do with how you come out the gates, yeah. having that's a it. plan. Yeah. Getting started the right way and planning out, kind of having the idea of how you're going to progress uh, through your programming, your workout makes a, tr- a huge, huge difference. And when I made this a priority in the gyms that I managed with the trainers that I worked with, when we laid a lot of this out, um, the success rate uh, went through the roof with the people that came into the facility. So um, I think that's a great idea, Adam. Let's cover all of that. Let's start with how they get started. Yeah, like uh, couch to gym, almost like that you know, couch to 4K or whatever that yes. was, marathon. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, so uh, number number one, the, the way you start is not by just jumping into a workout. You want to start with a self-assessment. Uh, an assessment tells you a lot about what exercises to focus on and which ones that you should not focus on. Um, as a trainer, there were many tests that we did on people mm-hmm. to identify movement patterns. That you know that that means uh, the way your body's moving. To identify muscle imbalances, that would tell us uh, some muscles are not as strong as they should be, or others are uh, too strong for the weak muscles. Um, we would identify maybe points of pain, and then that would help us start off with the right kind of workout. Because although all exercises have value. Some exercises are wrong for the are, are for certain people and are right for other people. This is this this is a, a big thing. Like the, like a, a lat pull down, for example, yeah. could be a great back exercise for someone. For someone else, it could actually increase the risk of shoulder this injury. This is such an important point to really individualize uh, the experience and make it more effective. Uh, I the thing is, there's lots of momentum and there's lots of hype kind of going into this, and there's lots of plans out there that are just sort of straightforward, like you know, plug and play. But if you don't really understand what you're bringing in, uh, you know, with with your patterns and and with your your current status in terms of your strength and your joint stability. Um, you know, you're going to be running into some problems, some big problems uh, down the road. Now, do you guys remember some of the hurdles, though, with with clients like they came in like this? So they just come in the new year and they're 20, 30 pounds overweight or they've fallen off the gym and they, and, you know, they lost a bunch of muscle and now they want to get back into building muscle again. And then here you are as a trainer doing this squat assessment, windmill assessment type of deal. And you know, telling them that we need to work on this and we need to work on that, but they're like, I want to just, I want to just lose Let's weight, go. or I just want to build yeah. muscle. Did you guys, do you guys remember overcoming? Oh yeah, that? oh yeah. That's 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 your job. Part of your job as a trainer is to really educate and inform the client um, because they come in with a, 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 they're unconsciously incompetent about what it really takes to accomplish their goals in a safe way, in a fast way. And also, most importantly, in a sustainable way. You know, mm-hmm. the they find in studies that the obesity epidemic kind of looks like this. People gain a little bit of weight throughout the year. They gain most of their weight in the holiday season, and then they don't lose it. So after one year, two years, three years, four years, 10 years of holidays like that, now they're 30, 40 pounds uh, overweight. Um, so, it's, so they come in with this conception, that, okay, I'm here. I want to lose all the weight. I want to get great results. I just want to bust my butt and then I'll be, I'll be good. It doesn't work that way. So a good trainer really communicates, okay, here's how we're going to start. Here's how we're going to continue. And the assessment is so important for this. Well, in two, I think it's just human psychology to kind of revert back to what your abilities used to be. And you don't really look at yourself um, any differently, uh, even though you've been doing different things for the past even few years sometimes. Like uh, the, a lot of clients I, I would have like initially would think that all these abilities for explosive movement and all that was going to be able to come right back. And, and this was something that, uh, you know, never left. Uh, and it's hard. It's a hard, it's an ego check a lot of times initially to to reveal. Oh, yeah. The whole, I used to do, I used to work out this way all the time. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and more to that point, Justin, is like, you know, a lot of times they come in and it's, oh, I, I want to look the way I used to look or I want to move the way I used to move. Yeah. And, you know, if it's been years and sometimes decades since they had been training and then they're coming in to work out, there's a lot of stuff that's happened to their body since then that needs to be addressed. Totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you were a 
you know, say a collegiate level football player in primo shape for most of your you know young adulthood, and then you get a job, you become an engineer, and then you sit at a desk all day long. And I get you three, five years later after being an engineer who's now out of shape and you now want me to get you back mm -hmm. in shape. And you are still connected to the, you know, Justin in college, the way I moved, the way I played, the way mm -hmm. I looked. And what you don't realize is there's been things that you've done uh, behaviorally around food, around movement, around sitting yeah, posture. and posture stuff that I have to address. If I'm a good coach, if I'm a good mm -hmm. trainer, sure, I can get you back into running 40s. I can get you back yeah. into doing some of those things. But I'm doing you a disservice if I also don't help you address all the other things that are happening. Yeah. So now, to be fair, assessments uh, that trainers will do, good trainers will do, they're very individual and they're to be quite honest, too complex for the average person to do on their own. If you don't have a training background, if you don't have an education in exercise and movement, um, it's not going to do you any good to do uh, a lot of these complex assessments. Um, so I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to give you a jet one simple general assessment. It's not perfect, but it's way better than just walking into the gym or just starting a workout. And I think the best one to pick uh, for people is posture. Uh, I think this is a great one because it does tell you uh, a lot about where you should start and exercises you should maybe focus on and which ones you shouldn't focus on. And I think we should talk about the most common deviations, uh, posture deviations that we would see in clients. Um, I'll start with one that I probably saw in eight or nine out of 10 clients. I would even venture to say today, if I were to do this on, especially uh, in the San Francisco, San Jose Bay area, yeah. I would guess it would probably be a hundred percent of the people that, uh, that don't work out that would have this particular posture deviation. It's known as forward shoulder. Okay. Forward shoulder looks the way that it sounds. Okay. Your shoulders kind of roll forward. By the way, when you do this posture assessment, stand up uh, tall, barefoot, um, and just stand comfortably. Don't try to stand straight. Don't try and do anything. Your posture is the, that you're assessing is your natural posture. So just stand up straight comfortably. Have somebody take a picture of you from the front, the side, and the back so that you can kind of identify what we're about to talk about. And again, the most common one, forward shoulder. That's the shoulders rolling forward. If that is part of your posture deviation, which it probably is, it usually means you have a weakness in the muscles of the mid-back, the muscles that pull the shoulder blades back. They're weak probably because you sit in, a, in front of a computer at a desk mm -hmm. or in front of your phone, so the shoulders are constantly rounded. Those muscles in the mid-back are not working a lot, and so they just get weak over time, and so this develops into your posture. I feel like, can, can I can I lump that into just, can we say upper cross syndrome? Because yeah. forward head is is directly tied into that. It's tied into that, and it's as common, if not more in common. And that's right. where the head juts forward. Right, right. especially yeah. with computers and phones today. I think I see that as as much, if not more, than what I see with the forward shoulders, and they both, I think, are paired okay. together. Now, earlier I talked about exercises that are good for some people and bad for others. So here's a good example. If you have forward shoulder, okay, doing lots of pull-down movements, like a cable pull-down, or even going out and trying to do lots of pull-ups, because you may lack the strength in the mid-back, you're going to actually encourage your body to have worse forward shoulder. You're going to pull yourself up, shoulders going to round forward, and you're going to encourage uh, or increase the risk of shoulder pain. In that person, I would not do those exercises. Yeah. The exercise or even would bench press. I mean, at some point, just being in the wrong position before you even start to do certain lifts that are pretty common uh, will add up a lot of unnecessary strength stress and tension in the joint, uh, which is, this is definitely one you need to identify early to catch it. So uh, you can strengthen where you need to strengthen and pull your body back into optimal alignment. Optimal alignment allows your joints to yeah. function the way, the way they need. The best exercise for forward shoulder, general exercise, is a row of some type. So this could be a band row. This could be a cable row. This could be a dumbbell row. But essentially what you want to do is you want to focus on not necessarily pulling the weight up, that's part of the movement, but you want to focus on the shoulder blades coming back and together. You want to imagine that there's a pencil in the, in the middle of your back and you're trying to pinch and grab it with your shoulder blades and also be careful not to shrug your shoulders. Oftentimes people with forward shoulder, when they tell their shoulders to pull back because those muscles are so weak, they instinctively shrug their shoulders. By the way, if you have forward shoulder, you probably also feel neck tension. So if I'm ringing some bells with you right now, this is probably an issue for so you. So two things I want to add to that. Uh, 
what this looks like in a program or workout, right? So if you're coming to the gym, is I'm addressing corrective stuff first and with light weight. So um, seated row, I think, is a, a, a great exercise to address forward shoulder. Um, but when I do it, I'm not doing it like a strength training exercise, right? Meaning you're not going heavy, or right? Hard. So you're, and, and I, I would have to repeat this to clients when we're doing corrective work. When we're doing corrective work, it's about the movement and what we're trying to to fix more than it is about oh you're this strong oh next week you're this much stronger oh this next week you're stronger than this it's it's more about the movement and so i'm going to teach this client a seated row with really really light weight for them mm -hmm. and i'm going to put a lot of emphasis on the retracting squeeze the pencil squeezing part that yes. sal's talking about i'm going to have them squeeze hold for like five yeah. seconds emphasize it with the isometric uh, yes. hold and and i i i use that a lot of times just for them to connect to that and really feel what that feels mm -hmm. like you know so that mind muscle connection which you hear about this is really essential in this beginning uh, journey to to really understand like technique but also understand your body and what you need to do to be able to get in now, those positions. You may be thinking, well, why can't I go a little heavy? I can do the exercise. It's super easy. Why not just go a little harder? Well, here's why. When you have an imbalance or a weakness, once you start to go a little too hard, your body's going to move the way it always moves. You're not going to be able to activate those weak muscles. You're going to move. Your body's going to pick and choose the way that you can move to move the weight the best way that you can do it. And that means the way you've always been doing it. If you do a, a, a row to strengthen your mid back and you go too heavy, you'll actually row with forward shoulder. You'll actually make forward shoulder even worse. So I'm going to give you an analogy so this kind of makes sense. If you learn how to type on your computer with just your index fingers, right, the hunt and peck method, and that's how you've typed for the last five years, and then someone comes and tries to teach you to do the correct way to type, and you practice the correct way to type for 30 minutes, and then they say, I'll give you 50 bucks if you could type uh, over faster than 50 words a minute, guess which way you're going to pick? The hunt and peck method because that's the way you've practiced for so long. When you push the speed, you're going to want to go the way you... You're faster with the slow way than you would be with the fast way until you learn the fast way and then you can far surpass the slow way. So this is why correctional exercise needs to be done light and focus on the squeeze and the form and the isometric portion. Also, back to Justin's point, which is he brought up the bench press thing, right? So this is where this also becomes very important is that... There's exercises that um, are, lend themselves better when you are in the proper posture. Well, all exercises lend themselves better in proper posture, but are really important, right? So when you we do a bench press, uh, one of the most common things when I would train clients is they have a hard time feeling it in their chest. Mm -hmm. The reason why a, a large percentage of these clients had a hard time feeling it in their chest is because of the starting position, because they get in the bench press and they don't realize their posture, that they are already in this rounded shoulder position. And so when you're in that position and then you perform the movement, and even to the untrained eye, you'll look at the movement and it looks right. It look, They're moving the bar up and down. They're balanced. It doesn't look like they're cheating anything. They're not using any leverage. They're just pushing it up and down and it looks like it's okay. But you have to be able to really look at their, their shoulder girdle and look and see if they're able to keep their shoulders retracted while they're also pressing. And because it's a pressing movement, which causes the shoulders and the arms and everything to come forward, it's even harder to think about staying in that retracted position. So this becomes even more important when I'm dealing with somebody who has upper cross syndrome, rounded shoulders, is that I got to prime with that movement. I got to do that seated row before I ever teach that bench press. And I may even, like Justin said earlier, avoid it mm. because it's so difficult for them to stay in that position. Me just bench pressing because I think it's a great, because we, we talk about that as one of the big movements, right? We say the benefits of it all the time. They may listen to Mind Pump. They hear that. They go, oh, I should bench press. Mind Pump mm -hmm. says it's one of the main exercises. But if you are doing it incorrectly, you're only going to make things more difficult for you down the road. And so, and if your main goal is health and strength and fat loss, I may avoid that movement at first until you get that connection down that you understand that, oh, when I bench press, I, I can't allow my shoulders to keep collapsing and rolling forward because then I end up pushing with my shoulders and my triceps and not with my chest. Right. So the next posture deviation that is uh, probably almost as common, I wouldn't say it's as common, but mm -hmm. almost as common as forward shoulder is known as an anterior pelvic tilt. So if you're if you're listening and you're confused, what does that mean? 
literally your butt sticks out, right? So yeah. if you were to look at your posture sideways, gives you an arch. You have a, you have an arch in your low back, and your butt is sticking out. Um, now this typically means that there's some weakness in your core, a tightness in your low back, maybe your hip flexor is a little bit tight. Now it's important that you, if you see this, that you do the right exercises because again, if you do the wrong exercises, you could potentially make this worse. An exercise, if you have this particular uh, posture and then you go do, I don't know, uh, back extensions, for example, um, and you don't really work on correcting this, you could cause yourself some low back pain. You may find low back pain when you do a, a squat because your back is so strongly arched. You may be someone, in fact, this may ring some bells, where your back gets really kind of tight and fatigued when you're driving for a long time in yeah. your car. Yeah, especially if you notice that you need to wedge a pillow uh, back there, a lumbo pillow, uh, which is something I, I worked through with my mom. It was it was very much oh, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, yeah, apparent that uh, there was there was a disconnection there. Uh, and this is this is one of those things you can train your way back to good connectivity with the core to be able to stabilize, uh, you know, your spine and your back and everything like it should. But it's going to take some work. Yeah. I addressed this in the the number one uh, viral video that we have on YouTube. So if you uh, look up in Mind Pump TV or just literally in YouTube, but in Mind Pump, uh, make your butt grow. And even though that is specific to making your butt grow, the movements that I teach in there are addressing this. So part of the reason why some people are challenged with feeling their butt and exercises that they're supposed to feel it in their butt and they feel it more in their quads is because of this posture issue. Because they have an anterior pelvic tilt, they are quad dominant. And and what it, when you have the stick your butt out look that Sal's talking about, you carry your weight over the top on your hip flexors and your quads. So then when you go to perform exercises like squats, uh, lunges, step ups, these exercises that should get a lot of glute involvement, they don't get a lot of glute involvement. The quads take over because of the posture. Mm -hmm. So even though that video I made was designed to help people with their butt, it's really is what I'm helping you with is your posture deviation. You've got this anterior pelvic tilt. I'm trying to help fix that, getting your glutes more involved in movements yes. where they should you be. You end up over-reliant on the wrong muscles. Right, right. Two other exercises that are good for this, uh, done properly, a physio ball crunch can be really good. You can find that on the Mind Pump uh, YouTube channel as well. We'll make sure, by the way, we link this, all of these in the show notes. Uh, I believe that's mindpumppodcast.com. So you'll be able to click on the links and watch these, uh, watch us teach you these exercises. And then there's another movement called the hip flexor deactivator crunch. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorites for working on anterior pelvic tilt. Because what it's doing is it's strengthening the core without overworking the hip flexors. Here's the interesting thing, right? You, you have anterior pelvic tilt. You don't know what it's called, but that's what you got. And you got back pain and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, strengthen your core. So you go do a bunch of ab exercises and what ends up happening? Your low back hurts even more. Like, what's going on? The doctor said I need to strengthen my core, but I do leg raises and I do those exercises and my back hurts even more. This is because your hip flexors are doing all of the movement and your abs are really playing second fiddle. Your core muscles are weak. Your hip flexors are tight and strong, too strong for your core, what we call stability. So you want to teach the core to be stronger without the hip flexors taking over. Those videos will help you with that and they'll help a lot with the pain. And you want, and here's the other thing too, Adam talked about priming earlier. By the way, priming refers to doing specific exercises before your workout so that, you know, working with your particular posture issues, when you move into your workout, they're not, they're not becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. A great way to prime if you have an anterior pelvic tilt before you do uh, like leg exercise, especially lower body exercises or deadlifts or other really effective movements, is to do the hip flexor deactivator uh, exercise that you'll see in that video that's and linked in the show. One notes. of the things that I used to have to overcome too with clients, and, and I want to make this clear, is that you know, you know they they come in and they want to do all these you know crazy exercises or get to their goal as fast as possible, and then here they get you know trainer Adam is taking them through these corrective movements that are light and boring, and we're priming. But what you need to understand is. If your body is moving incorrectly, performing the, what's considered the greatest exercises, say squatting or whatever like that, if it's if it's moving incorrectly, you're getting less benefits from it. Or if, no benefit. Or right. Yeah. So by getting you to move better, even though I'm having you do these little, what you might think are boring your exercises. Your whole experience is going to uh, benefit tenfold. That's right. It will only accelerate your results. Uh, and, and, and aside from what we're talking about with posture and pain, and of course, those are the, all the main reasons the trainer and us all want their clients to do that. 
but it also will accelerate your fat loss and your muscle building goals too. So even though it may not feel like it because it seems so simple and basic and you're not sweating and it's not, you're not like sore from these movements, but priming the body correctly so that when you go do these big movements, your body is moving in optimal, uh, more optimally, you'll get more results from it. Yeah, doing things the right way uh, gets you there faster. Uh, doing them the wrong way, even if it feels like you're more sore or sweaty or it's harder, won't get you there any faster and usually gets you there a lot slower or not there at all. Yep. Uh, now, the next step, right? So you did the self-assessment. We identified two common deviations. So now you got some ideas on what to work on there. So now you're like, okay, uh, I'm ready to do start with my workout. You want to start with stability first. Stability means you're tight, you're balanced. You don't feel like you're going to drop a dumbbell on your head. You feel like you're when you're standing and doing exercise, you're feeling very, very stable. You want to start with stability because if you have poor stability, you cannot progress. Poor stability is the foundation for everything else. You're not going to be able to go hard or heavy or push yourself when you have poor stability. I wish I realized this earlier, you know, even myself training that, you know, the more stable my joints were, the more access I had to strength. Uh, our, our body is capable of a lot of strength, but it limits that because of the instability in the joint. And this is something if we address this right away, and then we start building upon that, uh, the strength compounds significantly. Oh, well, it's interesting. It, when you first start working out, this is what you may feel. You may go and lift a weight, and it's going to feel shaky, or your arm is going to kind of move in funny ways with the dumbbell when you hold it over your head. Or when I was, you know, way I, d I used to describe it as a kid, is it felt like my muscles were laughing. Like I'd press a bar up and they'd, oh, da, da, yeah. da, 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 and I'd be like, why can't I push it smoothly? This feels so shaky and so weird. It's unfamiliar with it. You're, 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 you're unstable and you have to train through that and teach your body to become stable. One of my favorite tools for, for teaching clients to become more stable or their bodies to become more stable is to use dumbbells. Dumbbells, you have to balance them. Mm -hmm. You push a dumbbell overhead. You need to be very strong, straight, and stable. If you go heavier than your stability allows, you'll feel it. The hand will wait, will move all over the place. You'll feel like you're going to drop it. I love dumbbells for this purpose alone because it naturally controls the amount of weight people use. This is also why I like the, the physio ball. Oh, yeah. And this is where yeah. I use the physio ball. Uh, the reason why this is the natural progression is that. If we are working on posture and trying to get you more uh, you more aligned before you go into these movements, when we when we add in a, stabil a stability component into your your training, I'm 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 also working on posture. Mm -hmm. So in order for you to stabilize and balance, you need to have good posture. Yep. Yeah. So and I love using the physio ball because it's a, it's an external tool to help give you the feedback on that. So like for example, it challenges you know, it. Right. So let's say I, I have somebody I'm working on upper cross syndrome and 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 they weren't ready for a barbell bench press yet because they kept proning. But now we've done some good work on their posture. They're starting to get the retract thing and they're starting to work on some core and the lower cross syndrome stuff. And so. I put them on a stability ball now, and now they can kind of get, and what's great about that is the stability ball, I'm going to have them engage their hips, so they're having to stabilize their posture while also uh, performing this movement, so I'm getting the benefits of working their chest out. In addition to that, I'm also working on the stability and the posture, which is mm. running off of what we started with. Yeah, so the stability ball, physio ball, Swiss ball, it's a big right inflated ball. I think everybody knows what that is now, but uh, sit on one. Just sit on one versus sitting on a couch or a chair. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to slouch no. like you can in a it chair. Moves. You have to sit up tall and you have to have your feet planted and you have to engage your muscles differently to prevent yourself from rolling in one way or another. So exercises on a stability ball or a physio ball is excellent to work on stability. It's an excellent way to teach you how to become stable so you could progress later on to the more challenging stuff. Well, and yeah, and, and, and to this sort of phase point, like tempo is, is up the utmost importance in terms of going slow and really, yeah. uh, you know, owning the technique of it first before we really try to, you know, stress the body in different ways through, you know, altering that tempo with speed. Um, I just like to, to take everybody to, to, to slow down and really understand the mechanics of the lift, but also understand like how your body needs to adjust, which muscles need to kind of stabilize and activate uh, through these exercises. Just going slow from the beginning is such a better method. Well, this is also where the logic came from on how I taught a bicep curl. Now, you guys remember the video that the controversial did. one, yes, yeah. that I did on YouTube, right? It's another one of the one of the most viewed videos that we have on there, 
And it is, it is controversial. Like you got a bunch of people that were, of course, uh, that were talking shit about it. But this is where this this stemmed from. What I started to realize was I had these clients that had poor posture. They didn't have good stability. They didn't have good core strength. And then I'd try and teach, teach the most basic dumbbell bicep curl, which you would think is like one of the most easiest movements to teach somebody and they would be rocking their elbows and they would be swinging swinging their arms and arching their low back and they would be kind of all over the place and then i'd grab the dumbbells as a young trainer and i'd be like no like this you know and then, <laughs> or then i go over there and i like move their shoulders do as and, i do yeah and i just i couldn't get them to keep themselves in good posture while also trying to curl and then I realized what what the stability ball was doing, right, and when how that would force them into good posture. Sal made the point of try sitting on a, on a stability ball and doing an overhead press without having good posture. It forces you into that. So that's where I started to do this split stance with my clients. I said, okay, we're gonna balance on one foot, so I allow them to get in that split stance. The back foot's on their toe, so they're really off kilter. But what I noticed was, as soon as I made them kind of balance, it would force them upright. They mm -hmm. would stand up tall. Their core would naturally activate. In fact, right after I'd get them in that position, I would go to touch their belly button. I'm like, do you feel your stomach is slightly drawn in? That's your core right now activating and actually is like working like a vacuum around your spine to hold you in this posture. Then I'd hand them the dumbbells and then I'd show them how to perform the curl. And then all of a sudden they were magically in this great form. And it was putting that emphasis on the stability first and then teach the movement. And then you, what you see is the mechanics end up being a lot better. Right. And it's, it's, uh, and back to Justin's point, it slowed them down. Um, mm -hmm. Slow is important with stability. Slow is better than fast here. Okay. Slow, controlled. It should take you three seconds to lift the weight and at least four seconds to put it down. Do everything slow like that. You won't need a lot of weight. Focus on stability. Use the physio ball. That is the best way to start. And for most beginners, you're looking at training this way for maybe two to three months. And but by the way, within that two to three month period, you're building muscle, mm -hmm. you're burning body fat, like stuff oh, you're is still moving forward. Stuff is happening. Your body is changing. Now, after you move past that point, then things get really exciting. This is when I really like to have fun with a lot of clients. Now we get to focus on building overall strength. Yeah. Now, why is that important? Okay, well, if you want to build muscle, it's obvious. You want to build overall strength because that builds the most muscle. What if you just want to burn body fat? Focusing on overall strength has the by far the most profound positive effect on your metabolism. If you get stronger overall in a big way, you're going to burn more calories all the time just sitting there. And remember, there's two ways you can burn calories. One is your body's metabolism burns calories. The other way is to go out and move more to burn those calories. One of them takes a lot of work. It's very manual and it makes you sweat and it's hard and it takes time. The other one happens regardless. Regardless, you want to go bake cookies with your kids. You want to sit in front of the TV. You're at work. If you have a faster metabolism, you're burning more calories all the time. If you do it the manual way, well, that means you got to go take 30, 40 minutes aside to go to try to burn these calories. Building overall strength builds muscle and also boosts the metabolism. This is when you start to lift with the good you know, compound movements, the barbell exercises, your barbell squats, your barbell deadlifts, your bench presses, your overhead presses, your rows. You get strong with those. You start to see your body shape, male or female. It'll shape in a very positive way, and you'll see a huge improvement yes, with your metabolism. and resist the temptation to want to do all the creative, fun, mm. gimmicky shit. Yeah, uh, yes. uh, and, I, and I'm guilty of a trainer of doing this early on in my career, right, of, of wanting to wow my clients by – teaching them something so unique and creative and different that they've never seen or done to try and impress them. But when it comes to getting you the best results and what is the ideal way you should go, this is where we're at. We should be in these compound lifts. We should be trying to get good at those. And we should be drilling that home, doing them over and over and over and getting better and getting better at them versus, oh, new workout. Let's throw some new creative, cool exercises that are unique and different at my client trying to confuse the muscle. Yeah, do all these machines and do all these weird exercises don't do them. They don't give you nearly the same impact as these compound basic movements and getting stronger at them. Um, and this is this is a very, very fun time, okay? Yeah. This is when results start to really speed up. If you train your body properly, it's, by the way, 
results look like a snowball rolling down a hill. Mm -hmm. It starts to build up momentum and the snowball gets bigger and faster and bigger and faster. And this is when things really start to speed up. Yeah, it's a much louder signal now that we're teaching our body. There's a lot of demand. Uh, This environment has changed. So so therefore, our composition has to change. We have to build muscle to be able to uh, resist uh, these forces now uh, that are much more intensive. And in order to even get there, we had to get stable. We had to make sure all of our joints were nice and stable and prepared uh, properly to now add this load to it and add more of this intensity uh, because it's very demanding on the body. Well, it's, especially if, if you want the best results and you don't want to injure yourself, steps one and two are necessary before we get here. That's what I was just going to say. You, it's it, Because someone listening might be like, oh, that's the fast part? Yeah, let me I'm going to jump into that. It won't be the yep. fast part if you just jump into it. Then it, you'll just hit a, a big a brick temptation wall. to do that. You'll hit a brick wall. You got to do the stuff that we said first. But once you get here, things really start to kick into gear. As you get stronger with those lifts, I mean, you add 15 or 20 pounds to your barbell squat, your butt's going to look totally different. You can add 10 pounds to your overhead press, your shoulders and arms start to look different, by it, for example. This is where you can focus on intensity a little bit now. Now you can go in that you've set the stage, you've done your assessment, you've done a couple months of stability training. Now you can start to get in and start to push things a little bit. This is when it really starts to get fun and things really, really start to change. Now, I I would also like to talk about some of the struggles that beginners uh, encounter. One of the biggest struggles that I would see, aside from what we said earlier, which was the risk of injury and, you know, the the fact that they plateau, um, if you're doing what we're saying, uh, you're going to avoid those two things. But there's still another big hurdle, and that's this. When you first get started on a fitness journey, you do build a lot of momentum. And sometimes when that momentum is stopped, whether it's because, you know, something happened, you're on vacation, you don't have access to a gym, you have your your time is getting really tight, the kids are, you know, happening, you got your work and you're like, I can't, I don't have the time to drive the gym workout and then drive back. I only have time to work out. It, this really can screw people up because once they miss a couple workouts, it's, in my experience, it's hard to get them going. So you definitely want to have a plan for when you don't have access to equipment. You want to have a plan for when you're somewhere without a gym, somewhere without dumbbells, or you have a limited time. You want to have a plan. What kind of workouts can I do when that happens? There's two things that I think that really help that. Uh, The first thing is not overextending yourself on the commitment to the gym in the first place. Mm. So gym routines that ask you to be in the gym five to seven days a week because you think that you're going to get to your results faster, Mm. not a great idea for that reason right there. It is very difficult for the average person and to be consistent long-term five to seven days a week. So finding a plan that is more realistic effort. You can always add days later. So finding a plan that is more like two to three days a week to start off with and building upon it. That's, that's perfect. That's oh, the- yeah, I've seen more people be demoralized by missing a few days during the week and then like thinking, well, I can't do this, so I can't do any of it. Right, exactly. And stopping. So that's, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to have a body weight type of routine, a routine that you can do at your house, a routine routine that you can do in a hotel room, that you can do when you're traveling in the airport, anywhere you could think of, something that you can just train your entire body without any equipment or any weights. Having something like that at your disposal gets you out of that like, oh, I need to be in the gym. And it's okay. It's okay to be strength training, running like a MAPS anabolic type of routine three days a week in the gym. And then all of a sudden you take off for a week for Christmas and you're at a cabin or a hotel somewhere. There's nothing wrong with you switching to a body weight routine for that week. Now, the important thing is to have it planned out already. Okay. Be prepared Mm -hmm. before that happens. What you don't want to do is be caught off guard. Like you had, oh, I meant to go work out, but things got hectic. I only have 45 minutes. I'm at home. I don't have equipment or whatever. Uh, I don't know what to do. Okay. So you want to have a plan ahead of time. Here's another amazing tool, uh, resistance bands. I love resistance bands because uh, they're easy to travel with. They fit in a purse. Um, and you can do lots of exercises with them. Uh, most resistance bands yeah, these days- like three in your purse, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> most resistance bands have attachments in your door. You can put them in your doorway. You can do uh, pretty much any exercise you could do with a machine, you can do with a resistance band. So, and it's a very inexpensive investment. So I recommend that just to keep you consistent. That way, if you, again, if you don't have access to equipment or you have tons of time, you're still going to be able to. You need flexibility, out. so you, so you don't miss a beat. Now, the other thing that I see that that trips people up when when I'm when I'm first getting a client like this is their support system. 
And whether that is the support system that they have at home, um, very, and I know you this guys- This is huge. I, I know you guys can agree with this, right? Like uh, someone who has a spouse who is not on board with your new health and fitness journey, very extremely hard. difficult to to keep that client going. It really, really is. Mm -hmm. And And even if you do- Having a community or a support system that is is moving in the same direction or cares about health and fitness uh, as you do or as you do now, I think is extremely important for long term success. It's not something that I thought a lot about early on. Early on in my career, it wasn't like it didn't it didn't come up in our national certifications, our books of learning learning how to train people. It didn't come up that that was such an important piece. It was just over time training so many people and realizing, wow, if I had a client that had a spouse who wasn't on the same page nutritionally and exercise-wise, almost always they fell off if they didn't have some sort of a community. Right. So you could do this with a friend. You don't even have to work out necessarily together, but you just communicate and they're doing their own thing. You're doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. um, these days, uh, online communities are wonderful. You can go online, yeah. talk to groups, ask questions, especially because you're new and you're getting started in this. You're going to want to ask questions. Hey, look, I'm doing this barbell squat. I noticed this thing. What do you guys think uh, about my form or whatever? This is actually an important thing. Like Adam said, I didn't realize this until later on, but once I put this together, uh, it made a huge difference uh, with my clients. So there you have it, okay? You start out with a self-assessment. We give you a general one. Uh, you start with stability. You move to overall strength. That's when you increase the intensity. Make sure you have a plan for when things don't go the way you want them to go so you can still get your workout in and then connect with the community. Now, if you want something more specific, if you want this all planned out and mapped out for you, um, this month, we have a bundle of workout programs actually cover all this. So we talked about the self-assessment portion. We have a program called MAPS Prime. It's way more specific and individualized than just posture. In MAPS Prime, there's a compass test that takes your body through three movements and really helps you, uh, you know, identify and individualize correctional exercise. So it's very specific to you. Then we talked about stability, training through stability. We have a program called MAPS Starter. Map Starter literally is an entire workout designed with dumbbells and physio balls to help people build stability and strength through stability. Then we talked about building overall strength. MAPS Anabolic is our most popular workout program. It focuses on those really effective lifts. When you follow MAPS Anabolic over a few months, you will build tremendous strength. You will see your metabolism speed up. Then we have a program called MAPS Anywhere. MAPS Anywhere is all workouts, uh, just body weight or band-based. You need no equipment whatsoever. And you could do these, again, anywhere. That's why it's called MAPS Anywhere. And then finally, we talked about having that support system. We have a private forum called uh, the Mind Pump Private Forum. There's, I think, 3,000 people on there, all fitness enthusiasts, all listen to the podcast. You can literally go in there, ask questions, comment on other people's questions, and just get that support system that you need to stay consistent, especially in that initial six to nine month period, which by the way, all these workouts that come with this bundle takes you through for about uh, nine months or so. Oh, and by the way, um, myself, Adam and Justin also are on the forum a answering questions and interacting with people. And that's included in this bundle. And what we did with this bundle, and we did this as a special for December to help people get started in January, is we've taken the price of all these programs and cut them down tremendously. Once you enroll, you have lifetime access. To learn more about this, go to mapsdecember.com. Again, that's mapsdecember.com. Um, I, you know, if you want to maximize muscle growth, some cardiovascular help will help with that. So there's, there's, I don't want people going the opposite direction and think I do no cardio because I want to build the most muscle. Cardiovascular capacity and health will contribute to muscle growth for most people um, as well. That's true, but I also want to challenge that a little bit too, though. It, well, I mean, 